Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Laura Davis, and I'm from the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office, which is a network of over 40 independent civil society organizations uh, in Europe and working worldwide to build peace and to prevent violent conflict. And it is my great pleasure to invite you to this, to welcome you to this workshop of called Marsubit, which is a documentary showing followed by a high level panel discussion on peace building and climate adaptation. This is the fifth and final event in an online series entitled Climate Change and Human Security, Integrating Peace Building and Climate Adaption Pro Efforts in Practice. We're very pleased to welcome a distinguished panel for this event. We will be joined by Ambassador Thomas Ovowski, the German representative to the European Union's Political and Security Committee, Ms. Alina Bardrum, the acting director of Directorate A, International Mainstreaming and Policy Coordination at the European Commission's Directorate General for Climate Action, DG Klima, by Mr. Mark Friedrich, head of unit, the instrument contributing to stability and peace, foreign policy instruments at the European Commission. Mr. Obadiah Kisang, the Amara Programme Director from World Vision Kenya, and Sonia Reynes de Givenides, the Executive Director of the European Peace Building Liaison Office. We will, I will introduce the panel again after the showing, which will take around 20 minutes, and then we will be addressed by Ambassador Ovoski, who will be able to take a few questions, uh, but unfortunately he will have to leave us in an hour, and he will be replaced by Christoph Meinberger, also from the Permanent representative, Representation of Germany to the European Union. So you are all very welcome, and we'd now like to show you uh, this documentary, Marsavit. Climate change. What comes to mind when we hear the words climate change? For some, they resonate with a constant stream of reports. Scientific papers with statistics, predictions, protests, and debates about the planet and the future, our future, or even that of our children. Yet for others, climate change is not an abstract debate, nor is it about numbers and least about the future. For them, climate change is real, and it is now. High up in northern Kenya, close to the border with Ethiopia, lies the county of Masabit. It is situated in the Great Rift Valley, where the oldest human remains have been found. Today, Masabit is home to 13 indigenous tribes, including the Rendile, the Borana, and the Samburu. For centuries, these tribes have been living as nomadic pastoralists, like Lokote, Kor, and Lokule, who traveled the region with their cattle. But in recent decades, climate change has drastically affected their way of life. Prolonged drought has led to scarcity in resources, in turn leading to violent conflict among these tribes. However, members from all communities have decided to take action in response to these challenges. Young men from the region, like Lesi Makaro or Jeremy, have stood up as ambassadors for peaceful coexistence. Together with respected elders like Peter and women defying the status quo, like Tapairan or Gaspat and her daughter Rose, they refuse to let conflict govern their fate. Gaspat is the mother of nine children. She lives in a maniata, a settlement with traditional huts. Her daughter Rose has just completed her secondary education. We are, we are nine number, but two of them didn't went to school because um, many people are interested in their livestock. So, mom and dad they decided not to take two of, of our children to school. So one was staying to look after goats, and the other one to look after uh, cattle. Every Monday morning. 
Gaspard performs a special ritual, during which she ties a goat to the house and imbues it with milk. It is meant as a blessing to the gods to protect their livestock. To the tribes in northern Kenya, livestock is the centerpiece on which their survival depends. Once every 15 years, the community organizes a large celebration for all the teenage boys. After a circumcision ritual, they officially become Morans. For the next 15 years, they will have to travel and always make sure the cattle have enough grass to eat and water to drink. One of these young teenagers is Lokote. He has recently started his Moran life. The life of Moran has certainly never been one of ease and comfort. But as a generation of Morans is retiring and the next one is preparing to take over, things are not about to get easier. Jeremy is one of the children of his family who was sent to school. He now works for the government in peace building. I grew up in a, in a pastoralist, pastoralist setup, in a simple manata without basic necessities, like even uh, no sanitation facilities, no toilet, no, no school, no nothing. My family are people who move from point A to B, looking for a pasture for the animals and, and water. The impact of climate change on conflict in this part of Kenya has been enormous. What causes conflict is drought. When grasses are depleted, People scramble for these uh, grasses. They scramble for water. What, what will fall at the end of the day is conflict, a full-blown uh, conflict. The drought in this part of Kenya has been directly linked as a result of the effect of climate change. Previously, like 10 years ago, the frequency of droughts in this county is not as, as, as it is right now. We used to have maybe a drought after uh, five, six, ten years. Nowadays, every single year, or after every two years, conflict here is a direct consequence of climate change. The prolonged droughts caused major crises in these pastoralist communities. As animals weaken and die, food becomes scarce, creating widespread malnutrition. Growth disorders, low immune systems, and disease breakouts, such as cholera, hit hard. The population is left with little to subsist on. Kor and Lukule are the same age as Jeremy. But while Jeremy was in school, Kor and Lukule were living as Morans. 
traveling far and wide with cattle. In November 2019, Masabit experienced a particularly heavy rainy season. It's first in a long time. The grasses grew and brought the Morans closer to home. Gor is now back in his village for the first time in five years. As rainy seasons are becoming less frequent, violent conflicts are only at risk of increasing. But the people of these communities refuse to let the harsh climate conditions determine their future or to let chaos and conflict take the upper hand. Lesi Makaro is a respected leader of his community. He speaks of the same rough years as a Moran and is determined to make things change for the next generation. <laughs> Together with local members of the communities, the government and a consortium of NGOs, Jeremy and Lesi Makaro work on an initiative to foster peace in the region. They regularly organize so-called peace meetings. What we did today is we called young men here to engage them on two issues. 
natural resource management and the issues of conflict or violence. We were training these young men to make sure that they conserve the pasture which, so that they can be, it's going to be used during the dry period. If that one, is, that one is done, the level of migration from one place to another reduces. If it reduces, it means the conflict will go down. So that is one thing we are trying to tell them. We are also trying to tell them the effect of climate change. So we are trying to inform them from the word go that we have something called climate change. These are the effects of climate change. This is what's supposed to be done to maybe mitigate it. Peter is an elder. As peace chairman, he travels from village to village to speak to young Morans as well as elders. In case any problem arises, we will solve it using their strength, their fist. We will use it. But elders, they will never agree that. Elders will say, no, don't use the spear, don't use the sword, don't use a stick to make a difference between you and your brother. Use dialogue. A story is told in Masabi that happened some time back uh, where communities were fighting. So representatives from both communities were in the grazing field, intensively fighting, and they were moving closer to uh, each other. Probably people could have lost their life and their livestock. Then one member decided, uh, as it, it was enough for fighting, he threw away his gun, he took a white piece of cloth, raised it up and moved to the perceived enemy. So the enemy saw a member from the other community coming with a white piece of cloth raised up and they were so surprised what is happening. So they decided not to kill him. This particular person went until he got uh, the crowd that was fighting back and asked them why are we fighting and we are our brothers. They all came together and agreed that they need to live like brothers and they don't need to fight. They went back home that day and the fighting stopped. But dialogue is difficult to achieve when all people can think about is the survival of their livestock. So along with the efforts made in fostering peace, the communities are also working to find viable alternative livelihoods. Nasa <laughs> Kuranasha <laughs> Eh, <laughs> Asadi mara sipoki ngai gata kopoki ngai no badage na mata eh gata kopoki ngai no badage na nguliare na ngure ni ni wari atal gulenje 
kai bungu na ka bagi ninya mata kai tia tua nya sai riedi. Eh kai bar jaba ngana ninja na jika mana mi e yutu da sinta ina ngi para. Mara las mana si pi kompara na yu da kena. Ama ta ati nungu na na bana na na iko yung kolong. Iko ti nungu na sin iko ti nungu na iko yung kolong. Iko dua ti nungu na sin shida yang kopang. Ka de di min jana ai kona na yu. Nol da baga kai la yin mi kari kili kai yin kai do. Nol ba ngin na sa ku 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 ti ngi ngi ngi. Kali dia ye punya sana, nurnya sengai bangen ye, ni kai gigi gigi nana stop lagi ni. Nanti nanti. So I hope you all very much enjoyed that screening of the documentary Mars Sabit. And we, it is now time to move to the high level discussion on peace building and climate adaption. Now, this event is being organized with Adelphi and with the Climate Diplomacy Initiative and with generous support from the German Federal Foreign Office for which we're very grateful. Uh, for your information, this event is being recorded and the documentary is available online should you wish to see it again, and please do share it with friends and colleagues. Um, we will now move to our panel, who I will introduce um, again very briefly. For a moment, we will have a, a short first round of interventions, and we very, very much welcome comments and observations uh, from all of you who are joining us here today. Now, if you would wish to ask a question, please uh, state clearly who you would like to ask the question to, or if you would like to make an observation, please use the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen, and then we will come to you and invite you to unmute your microphone so that you can ask your own question or make your own observation, as we are trying to keep this as human as possible, even if we cannot be together. So, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel for this afternoon. First of all, we will hear from Ambassador Thomas Osowski, who is the German representative to the European Union's Political and Security Committee. And at half past the hour, he'll be replaced by Christoph Meinberger, also from the permanent represent representation of Germany to the European Union. We will then hear from Elena Badrum, who is the acting director at the Directorate A of International Mainstreaming and Policy Coordination at DG Klima at the European Commission. Then Mark Friedrich, head of unit to the Institute instrument contributing to stability and peace and the foreign policy instruments at, also at the commission. Then we will hear from Mr. Obadiah Kisang, the Amara program director from World Vision Kenya, and Sonia Reynes Duvenides, the executive director of the European Peace Building Liaison Office. So Ambassador, if I could turn to you first and ask, we saw in uh, Masterbeat in the documentary, the impact that the climate crisis can have on peace and conflict dynamics. Could you tell us a little please about how the German government is approaching the linkages between the climate crisis, peace and conflict? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much Chair for, for the introduction. Uh, indeed I'm very happy to join this panel today and I was also extremely um, um, pleased by the, the, the movie you showed because it uh, just it's just a glimpse of how um, complicated the situation is and how urgent it is to, uh, uh, to, to give answers. As uh, when I was posted as a diplomat to Central Africa, I had the, the, the chance to, to, to travel through Masabit country from Turkana Lake to Masabit. And we were at the time accompanied by uh, uh, two young Samburu boys. And indeed they carried their swords with them because they were not so much afraid to get into a conflict. Um, with other tribes, um, so I could see it myself. And when I was posted as an ambassador to the Pacific region um, in the Marshall Islands, I could see how the Marshall Islands themselves, the very existence of the state is threatened by climate change with these king tides um, when they 
uh, flood uh, the, the, the islands, the atolls. And um, so action is more urgent than ever. And that we, want, that we live in one world today and that we need to connect with each other on this particular topic, um, it's so obvious. And uh, sometimes it's even difficult to understand that not everyone has understood it yet. Now, what the German diplomacy tries to do is to connect us, um, to, to participate in connecting um, our international action. I mean, there are different um, um, uh, strands of, 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 uh, of proceeding. Uh, during our membership in the, United, uh, in the United Nations Security Council, we are trying very hard to promote the topic climate change, also as an international security threat as a regular topic in the Security Council and that it should also be seen as, um, um, a, as an important factor which contributes uh, to, to instability uh, more than ever. So and we are very happy that we also have support of many other states in that endeavor, particularly also with Kenya, but um, uh, also with other EU uh, Union member states. Um, so um, we, we, we are on a good track in promoting the topic in international fora, but uh, we have to do much more. We are glad that with the new US administration and in particular with the appointment of John Kerry, we have a new partner in this uh, endeavor, in this task. Uh, definitely the United States was missing in this debate in the last years and we all should be happy that we have now a new administration coming up which sees climate change and the threats to international security by climate change as a very important element um, to, uh, or as a very important topic to be addressed. And uh, we, 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 we all know that we couldn't achieve a lot if we don't have also the support of the United States to work here collectively with us. It is for sure that um, mitigation is key. Um, we believe uh, that uh, the Paris Climate Accord uh, um, must uh, deliver. Um, we uh, are ourselves determined to become climate no neutral by 2050. We call on others to follow. Today, the European Council takes place here in Brussels, uh, as you know, and um, one important topic of discussion will be already to reinforce our climate ambition by the year, year 2030. And we also do that with the conscience that uh, European countries are among the world's top greenhouse gas emitters. And that's why we bear also particular responsibility here to go ahead and to be also an avant-garde in showing how, 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 how that issue can be addressed internationally. And uh, perhaps I will leave it by that for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. And I'd like to turn now to Ms. Alina Badram from uh, DG Klima. And I'd like to ask you, Ms. Badram, uh, look, look, looking forward, what opportunities do you see for the EU's climate related efforts, including under the European Green Deal, to contribute to human security and to peace? And what would you say are some of the ways to enhance how climate sensitivity is mainstreamed into the EU's peace building and conflict prevention work? Thanks very much. Uh, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Okay, excellent. So firstly, let, let me thank you very much, uh, European Peace Building Liaison Office, Adelphi and the Climate Diplomacy Initiative for the, for the timely event and for sharing the Mars Abit, uh, documentary with us this morning. Uh, I think we very often working from Brussels, we may be talking about the importance of climate security, but hearing the real voices, the testimonies from uh, those people who are impacted uh, by these threats already today is a very important and pertinent reminder of the acutely uh, uh, needed action and, and uh, the, the, the role that uh, the different stakeholders can play in um, mitigating the negative consequences of climate change. We um, convened today um, on a day which is very important from the point of view of European climate ambition. Uh, our leaders will be talking at the Council uh, uh, about the increase of EU's 2030 ambition 
uh, the climate science is, is uh, demonstrating time and time again uh, the, the threats and the gaps that exist in, in global ambition. And it is our responsibility to, to ensure that our global community can deal with the different aspects of uh, consequences of climate change, including the security threats. The um, adverse consequences of climate change and environmental degradation remain of utmost concern for the EU and its member states. They undermine peace and security, global sustainable development, water security, health, economic prosperity, food security and livelihoods. Climate change is truly an existential threat to humanity and biodiversity across all countries and regions, and it requires an urgent collective uh, response. In the EU Council conclusions on climate diplomacy from January 2020, EU member states once more acknowledge how climate change multiplies threats to international stability and security, in particular affecting those in most fragile and vulnerable situations. The EU recognises that the effects of environmental degradation and climate change not only increase the risk of humanitarian crisis, displacement and conflict, especially in fragile states, but are also most felt by populations already affected by these crises, including refugees, internally displaced persons, children, elderly, people with disabilities and other persons in vulnerable situations. This has become particularly clear in conflict zones impacted by climate change. Climate change also increases the security insecurity of people who depend on natural resources for their livelihoods. This in turn will increase the probability that they will migrate. Many people who depend directly on natural resources will find their livelihoods endangered by climate change. In some areas, climate change will reduce grazing land, dry up water resources and threaten jobs connected to vulnerable economic sectors, as was also evidenced in the documentary. These environmental changes can combine with um, other problems, such as populations to seek alternative livelihoods uh, elsewhere. Some will move to urban areas that already suffer from high levels of unemployment uh, and poor living conditions. Climate change will alter both existing migration patterns and the number of people likely to move. The increased movement driven by climate change impacts could, if migration and resettlement are poorly managed, lead to instability and international crisis. Similarly, the EU Council conclusions on security and defence adopted in June 2020 ask Commission and the EAS to come up with a set of concrete, short, medium and long term actions addressing the links between defence and climate change as part of a wider climate security nexus, notably in the areas of civilian and military common security and defence policy, capability development, multilateralism and partnerships. As a follow-up, the EU Council adopted on 9th of November a climate change and defence roadmap, which covers the operational dimension, the capacity development dimension, and the notion of strengthening multilateralism and partnerships. Increasing climate adaptation capacities and disaster risk reduction globally is a priority to the EU, in particular supporting the efforts of these developed countries that are extremely vulnerable to disasters, climate change droughts, as well as threats to water security. As part of the Green Deal, the EU is enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change with a new, more ambitious EU strategy on adaptation to climate change, which will be adopted early 2021. This uh, strategy will include a strong uh, dimension on international and out of our external spending, our external heading instruments, 25% uh, will be allocated uh, decisively to climate action. In our assessment of conflict risks, we are increasingly integrating climate, water and environmental degradation risks as threat multipliers. Climate and protection concerns are increasingly a key consideration in humanitarian interventions. Similarly, climate and environment actions should be conflict sensitive. In fragile states, underdevelopment is intractable and national capacity to understand, estimate and manage climate crises is weak. Climate change adaptation strategies and plans represent a key policy instrument as they help countries to anticipate the adverse effects of climate change and take action 
to prevent, minimize and respond to potential impacts. EU support uh, will be especially pertinent in Africa, as Africa is a partner for the EU and the EU has actively supported climate change mitigation and adaptation there for many years. Climate change is also a high priority on the agenda of African leaders. It is very important that we really build the synergies and, and uh, make most of this commitment. We all have a role to play in turning this global climate challenge in an opportunity to shape the future we want. While the EU is ready to lead by example and the European Green Deal provides us with the blueprint for that, um, we need action by others. In the European Green Deal communication, Africa is mentioned more than any other region with the wide range of priorities aimed for Africa. We are now reflecting on how to strengthen our partnership even further and those conversations will intensify as we approach the EU-Africa Summit next year. We have the unprecedented opportunity to embark on a completely different development pathway. Clearly, the transition to low carbon and climate resilience will go hand in hand in this regard. Maybe mention a couple of initiatives that are directly relevant to Africa here. The Economics of Land Degradation Initiative, together with the uh, UNCCD, and GIZ is an initiative aiming to reach 1 million hectares of land and 500,000 households by 2022. The aim is to build capacity with local farmers to promote sustainable land management. The LOCAL, the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, which is run through the UN Capital Development Fund, currently operates in 14 countries, including Sub-Saharan Africa. And the work is directly linked to the nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Finally, we're about to launch together with the UNEP, UNDP project under the Pivotal African Adaptation Initiative with 1.1 million support in the full understanding that this is an initiative for Africa, which is driven and coordinated by Africa. The project will produce, among others, a state of adaptation in Africa report and it will also work to build capacity and knowledge for adaptation projects in this regard. I will stop here. Sorry to have taken a little bit extra time, but I think it's very important to focus on the concrete areas and scope for doing more. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Bardram. And now um, I'd like to turn to Mr. Mark Friedrich, the head of unit from the Instrument Contributing to Stability and Peace, the ICSP. Now, uh, Mr. Friedrich, the ICSP has um, enabled the EU to support peace building actions that affect, sorry, that address climate related conflicts and threats to peace. So what do you see as being some of the challenges and opportunities um, in the future uh, that would help us to improve how we think and act on addressing these linkages between conflict prevention and climate adaptation? Thanks. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, and thanks to EPLO, Adelphi and, and the German representation for, for organizing this event um, and to um, allow us to engage on this important topic. Um, I, think, I think Alina has already been quite uh, extensive in terms of where the, the EU is moving in this respect. Um, let me just pick up on a few things more from a peace building uh, perspective. I think many of us in the peace building community have been soul searching over the last few years to try and establish the link between climate change and conflict. Um, and I think sort of documentaries like the one that we just saw uh, make it very clear. It's, it's almost like, um, uh, I mean, I, I recall recently listening to a, a US Supreme Court judge saying, um, I, don't, I may not know how to define pornography, but I sure know it when I see it. And I think that is a little bit also what is happening to us when we come to conflict and climate change. Amongst peace builders, we spend a lot of time soul searching to see where exactly the links are. But when we look at concrete examples, like the one that we just now saw, um, it, it falls into place and we can immediately see where the points are where we as peace builders can work on. And I think that's maybe the most important message here is to ensure that 
um, we as peace builders are not scared away by uh, statistics um, on climate change that may be difficult to understand, that you know, it, uh, may be sort of coming from a different uh, area of expertise uh, before we get engaged. I think in terms of the type of engagement that we need, the documentary that we've just seen has a lot of lessons to teach us about the dynamics of climate change and then the knowledge about how exactly climate change and conflict interrelate will come with time. Um, and I think it is something where we sometimes get a little bit too uh, essentialist about trying to have the exact link and the nature of it defined beforehand. We are oftentimes obsessing with root causes of conflict, although we accept that in many other fields, um, you know, whether it is uh, the influence of religion, whether it is the influence of ethnic tensions. Um, we know that we cannot always get to the root causes before we start addressing the conflict. So I wanted to make this point at the beginning here to just be clear that even if we don't understand the full extent or the full nature of the linkage, that does not stop us from starting to address the link. Um, and I think that's very clear in, in the emphasis that the EU is now putting uh, on both climate change, on peace at the, at the highest level. Uh, and this is having an impact on all parts of the institutions, as Alina has already uh, pointed to. Maybe I will just briefly say that for the crisis response instruments, for example, one of the issues that uh, we will be taking up um, to, to reflect this better in future is, is that we will look at all of our actions before we start them to see how far are they climate relevant and how far are they climate responsive. This will be a bit of a difficult exercise for us. Um, many of us indeed uh, are new to this, uh, just as many of you are. Um, but I think it's a very useful one uh, to simply sort of tease out where the links are with time. So we want to increase our engagement and better understand the linkage, linkages. Um, and we want to sort of do that by, facilitate a great, by facilitating a greater interaction and cooperation between peace building and climate change experts. Um, there is widespread agreement that climate change fuels conflict, and there is a body of work to substantiate this claim, but there's still relatively few examples of how we can actually uh, work together to identify the solutions. So I think one thing that the documentary showed us very clearly is that there is no scope here for imposing ready-made solutions. We very clearly saw that the people who were active in terms of finding the solutions were people who um, you know, were uh, local leaders um, or also, and I thought that was interesting to see, those who had grown up in these communities and then had moved on and received further education and were able to move on um, and, and, and come back to their communities and share some of that knowledge. Um, these, <coughs> excuse me. So I think, you know, the, the, the farmer grazer alliances that were mentioned here, the community dialogues, the strengthened governance of, of natural resources and, and the kinds of technological innovations that we may have, for example, through meteorological mobile apps. Um, those are all sort of technologies, approaches that we can use to address this. And when we want to focus on supporting local initiatives like the one depicted in the documentary, those local ambassadors, as they were referred to, um, you know, to are really quite important in terms of bringing about that peaceful coexistence. Um, and I want to particularly uh, highlight two points uh, from the documentary. The first is, um, and I felt that was brought out very well in the documentary, the importance of bringing women leaders in. You could very well see in the documentary that there was a fairly clear division of labor between women and men in this community. Um, and that, for example, the, uh, the, the extension worker of, of, of World Vision, I think it was, who was uh, um, there was, was a man, uh, perhaps it was coincidence, um, but some of the leaders who actually carried this issue forward and who were speaking about their leadership positions were women. 
Um, and this is quite important. We, we see this in very many parts of the world, be it climate change that is at issue or other stakes that are at issue. We will not be able, to, when it comes to conflicts, these things interlink. We will never be able to fully tell them apart. But what we do know is, is that when we do have both women and men involved, young and old, uh, that's when we have a possibility of capturing the full um, um, sort of width of, of the conflict issues, and thus also we have an opportunity to, to address peace. Um, I think the other issue that is important and that was also flagged in, in the documentary is about the importance of getting to people ideally before their livelihoods are completely at threat. Um, I think some of the examples that were mentioned uh, showed that by the time that things get so strained that people have no other means than to, you know, graze on other people's land, um, that's, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid violent conflict. So we need to be there prior to that. We need to anticipate those issues. And I think some of the learning that, that uh, the villagers there were undertaking and that we can facilitate if we work together as um, uh, climate scientists and peace builder can certainly help us in, in doing that uh, more so. So I will end here. Thanks very much for, for this opportunity to watch the documentary and to discuss with you about it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And um, before I turn to Mr. Obadiah Kisang, I would just like to um, draw our attention to the fact that Ambassador Osofsky uh, does need to leave us. And so we'd like to thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, uh, for, your, uh, for your contribution and support of this event. And also we'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Christoph Mainberger, also from the German pe Permanent Representative, who will be uh, responding to questions on behalf of the German government. So thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. And now, um, Obadiah, I'd like to turn to you. Um, we saw in the documentary that improving natural resource management is a key component of the program IMARA that you direct. Could you share some insights and some lessons learned with us, please, on how strengthening local governance systems for sustainable natural resource management can contribute to peace? and how local civil society actors should be supported by external actors, whether they be governmental or non-governmental, whether how we, as ex uh, how we as outsiders can support local civil society actors doing, uh, taking on this work. So Obadiah Kisang, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And I greet all the participants. I'm happy this time to be part of the participants to review this uh, Marsabit uh, documentary, which was done uh, within our area of cooperation. Uh, Imara is a program uh, of World Vision Kenya and is funded by uh, Embassy of Sweden in Nairobi. And uh, we have three outcomes that we are addressing and I just want to just mentioned briefly and link up with the question that uh, Laura has uh, asked me. One of our out outcome is to secure livelihoods and strengthen market systems for our communities. And uh, the reason why these are major focus areas is because uh, people have been relying on one source of livelihood and that is livestock. Pastoralism has been part of their life. But now the diversification of sources of life load, now our people are reducing uh, pressure on land that is caused by uh, livestock. So we're looking at opportunities that can generate income for our people. Uh, these could be starting businesses, looking for financial services from uh, maybe banks or MFIs uh, just to run their business. And then we are looking at uh, use of natural resources in a very sustainable way. The second outcome is about uh, sustainable management and rehabilitation of land, forest, and water resources. 
Now, this second outcome is addressing the real issues that is causing conflict among our people. Because the main conflict that we have in our semi-arid and arid areas is resource-based. And resources for livestock keeping is just land, forest, and water. And therefore, we are saying that I want to enhance rangeland and forest management. We have heard from the gentleman that they move away from home for quite some time in search of pasture and water for their livestock. But we are saying that if we improve management of the rangelands, that's the pasture, where even they are conserving some for the dry season. Now this has reduced that migration where they meet with other people also looking for the same resources and they end up uh, fighting. And then we are talking about increased access to water and protection of water sources. The water sources that used to be there are really uh, no longer providing enough water. And therefore we are saying that we need to increase access by ensuring there is more water sources and also protecting the existing ones. Uh, the other part of it is to look at uh, promotion of sustainable and renewable energy options. Uh, people have been relying on uh, firewood and we are saying that we can improve that by just coming up with the biogas units which are now being used very well and they are using the cow dung or even the droppings from the sheep and goats to feed into the biogas digester and that one is becoming a very good source of uh, renewable energy and the raw materials are easily uh, uh, available. We also have the solar options, which uh, people have adopted very well because the sun is in plenty because we are along the uh, equator. Now, the third and the last outcome is about strengthened governance system and structures for sustainable natural resource management at the community, county, and the national level. Now, this third outcome is backing up outcome one on livelihoods income and on management of natural resources. This is uh, in appreciation of the fact that if we don't have good governance and the structures to support what we are putting in place, then the gains can easily uh, be eroded. And, uh, one of the methods we are using is uh, social accountability. Uh, and this uh, social accountability is the one that is being led by the citizens themselves. And therefore the role of the civil society is really to build the capacities of this community to understand what they would like to champion from the government and mobilize themselves and present their issues to the leaders at the county level, the elected leaders, so that their issues are presented uh, to the county assembly and even the national assembly, so that they are considered. And therefore it is key for the civil society really to be facilitated, to have the knowledge and the financial support to mobilize uh, the community uh, to really uh, know their rights, and present them in a way that is more acceptable uh, when the communities actually uh, uh, push uh, for it. Uh, for us, we have uh, already a group in, in place that we are calling Citizen Voice and Action uh, uh, Volunteers. And these, these are now people who have been trained and they are going around identifying groups that have uh, some interest together, uh, support them with their capacity, and then now they are facilitated to present uh, their issues. So this is something that is really uh, moving even without the presence now of a civil society in those areas. And therefore it's a good way of ensuring that communities can continue to engage and champion for their issues. Uh, the other issue to look at in area of uh, governance is really to engage uh, and on review and even development of natural resource policies and uh, legislation and 
Ortiz. Uh, we have a number of uh, policies and sometimes back. And right to say that a number of them have been uh, supported by civil society to be reviewed and updated to be relevant to the situation now. And then uh, they support in disseminating because a policy is not good or a law is not good until it is put into practice. So the civil society groups are the ones who are supporting in dissemination to the lowest level and making sure that people understand they interpret correctly and hold their government accountable for the uh, implementation. So the civil society are the ones who build the capacities of the members of the county assembly at the national assembly to know really how to legislate and even to seek for technical uh, expertise to, to ensure that they have the correct role, uh, policies and laws and rolled down the point of implementation. Uh, the other thing that is under this governance that is of importance uh, to us and uh, all civil society is uh, strengthening engagement with the various government levels. In Kenya, we have the county and the national level, which have got uh, assemblies and their budgets. So here it is uh, the, su the support of the civil society that ensure communities understand the budgeting process and they participate through uh, public participation forums such that when government are collecting views on budgeting, the communities are aware, they are prepared themselves and they can present their issues so that they are factored in the budget. Last year, uh, one of our county assembly, and that is uh, in Samburu County, were able to pass a bill that ensures the county government of Samburu allocates uh, 200,000 US dollars to community conservancies every year. So this is a big plus because of the uh, advocacy that ensure that the county government is recognizing the importance of community conservancies and therefore they need to support them every year uh, by allocating resources and they can be able to implement laws and strategies in place. So this is something that can be replicated uh, in other counties and other countries. Finally is on the issue of conflict itself. When it occurs, it becomes a challenge. Communities fight among themselves and even communities from outside come to fight. And this is a time now when the civil society bring together as a neutral group, the political leaders, the opinion leaders to come together annually or quarterly, or in case there's an issue to discuss, make peace and move forward with their development. So let me stop there, uh, Laura, uh, so that you can continue with your program. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Obadiah. And now I would like to turn to Masonia Reynes Givanides, who's the executive, executive director of EPLO. So, Sonia, we have seen in the last couple of years there has been an increased focus on the need to address the linkages between climate crisis and peace and conflict dynamics. So, what are your thoughts on how to continue raising awareness on these issues and on the importance of working together across the peace building and climate adaptation communities? Thanks, Laura, and I will certainly get to that question in one second, but I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Kasung for running a fabulous program, but also welcoming um, my EPLO staff and filmmakers into your community, into your project uh, for five days. This documentary was only filmed over five days, and which is kind of remarkable. And the first screening of the documentary took place in Nairobi, where Mr. Kasung also organized for some of the community members that were featured in the film to come and see it for the first time. So I wanted to thank you specifically, also all of the organizers of this, and um, to the, the flexibility also of um, Mark and his team at FPI for looking at how film can also be used as a way to bring these issues uh, to the forefront. And um, 
the film so far has had uh, almost 6,000 views and it really shows us you might not yet be able to change behavior by just viewing something, but it means that we're all having these conversations together. Um, in terms of uh, what more can be done, I think there's sort of two sides of it that we've seen throughout this series and also through the film. One is about carrying out the climate sensitive conflict analysis, but basically as opposed to all of us in various different sectors analyzing a situation independently, how can we look together at um, you know, I think what is quite long-term and short-term styles of analysis that are done from different communities. Ideally, how do we do that together? Um, another thing you see very, very potently in the film is really in, um, working with and engaging the populations that live in these places. The solutions were theirs, and it's about how to support them um, and not bring anything in from the outside. So there's the analysis, but how do you actively involve uh, in the decision making in every single piece of it, the communities that will be there a long time after everybody else has uh, gone. And I think some of that really is just the first step and a lot's been touched on in, in the conversations today. Um, so it is about, you know, peace building organizations and other sectors engaging together. Um, we've seen through the film some really wonderful examples. I have to say it was a deliberate choice to include the women's leadership element in the film. And I think we need to look a lot more about how to make sure in the decision-making around climate adaptation, we have women, men, boys and girls, and, and, and what does that look like? Um, I'm also quite struck, and I have to say, uh, a couple of years ago, it looked really, it was very interesting to look from a peace building perspective at how the defense community had really um, began to look critically at this issue when only a few peace building organizations had this as kind of a core area of work. And um, so I think it's something that peace building organizations also need to be more in, in those discussions so that it isn't just, um, uh, yeah, defense and climate change, but also what's the sort of peace and longer term approach to it. And I think also um, we've seen the, the opportunity that this brings for multi-mandate organizations like World Vision, who do so many different things and they have the ability, they do peace building, they do development in other areas. And so I think it's fitting for the multi-mandate organizations to also document and for us to learn from them, how are they doing the peace building, climate sensitive, climate adaptation work together, um, because it's really their, their sort of best fit in the sector of um, putting these things into action. So I would love to get to the question and answer. I wanted to thank everybody again for the opportunity and um, uh, I loved watching the film again. Do watch it outside of this because it was super slow um, because of the streaming, but I think that's just a the nature, we did get through it and happy to engage and answer any questions anyone has. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. And I'd also like to take this moment to welcome uh, Christoph Meinberger. So hi. Um, so we have, we're now having a uh, quite brief uh, question and answer session. Um, we have two questions in the um, in the box already. The first will come from Margot Jones and the second from Marie La Maria Laura De Angelis. So please both of you be ready to unmute your microphone and to pose them. Both questions are put to the ambassador. So Mr. Meinberger, we will be uh, turning to you for, uh, for answers to these. Whilst, um, Whilst these questions are being put, please indicate in the Q&A box if you would like to make an observation or to ask a question of one of our panelists. Um, please do this whilst uh, the first question is being asked because we have limited time, so we would like to see how many questions and observations there may be. Okay, so um, Margot, over to you. Would you like to pose your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Um, so Ambassador Osofsky mentioned John Kerry's appointment as the new U.S. Uh, climate envoy. And so I was wondering, Mr. Mainberger, if you uh, could tell us more about what you expect from this appointment in terms of climate and security, and maybe also about uh, what Germany's future plans in relation to these issues are after leaving the U.N. Security Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margot. And we'll also take the next question. Maria Laura, would you like to pose your question? Thank you, Laura. Um, well, my question was partly addressed by so Sonia. Uh, th th thank you. And it was uh, 
mostly be because even when we start to see in the documentary, uh, it is mentioned how uh, the pro problem of, cl of, of, of climate change uh, is seen as something very far away. And uh, at, the, uh, at the moment, while the EU is trying to lead uh, on action against cl climate change, we don't have a very wide political support because in the um, electorate is still per perceived as a rich people's issue. We don't have the working class actually uh, back in it. But I couldn't help but no noticing that the, the, the moment when we put um, uh, peace building uh, uh, lenses, um, when we looked at the pro 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 problem, it did change into something that is very present, actual, and it is already part of our la la lives. And I was just thinking that while Sonia was talking about already this being a first step in how we change the, the debate among us, uh, about it, um, whether we, uh, and that's why my question was uh, addressed more to the G G German re representation, how we are pl planning to channel um, these new learnings into the mainstream communication to the wider pu pu public and thus to re re resist the action of uh, climate change ne negationists um, onto the wider political debates in the EU that might affect how uh, the EU can actually uh, face this pro pro problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christoph, would you like to respond to those questions? Yes, of course. Um, can you understand me well? Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks of all and uh, hi to everyone, first of all. Um, Thanks for, for having me in this discussion, uh, um, stepping in for Ambassador Orsovsky, who unfortunately had to leave early. Um, first, a question uh, regarding John Kerry. Um, just as a brief um, anecdote, I, before coming to Brussels, I was working in Berlin uh, for a couple of years on the field uh, of climate and security in particular, and uh, we, we were kind of active. Uh, during the la last two years since we, uh, due to our membership in the Security Council, where we defined this issue as a priority for our membership, we were, of course, trying to, 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 cre to create more momentum for this and more awareness. And we had the, the um, two Berlin climate and security confer conferences uh, in Berlin, one in 219, one in 220. And uh, the last one was, uh, of course, due to COVID uh, virtual, but the first one was a, actually a physical event where John Kerry was uh, one of the uh, keynote speakers. So, um, and this was really impressive to see how, how engaged and how, how knowledgeable um, this man is in this field. So I think it's a, it's a very good sign that he was, he was his designated uh, advisor to, to this particular issue. So um, I'm, I'm sure that he will push the fight against climate change up on the American and on the global agenda. So he's really committed to this task. He's as I said, knowledgeable and I think he's a strong political leader. So this will, this will be a real, real um, push to this momentum that we have tried to create. Um, it remains to be seen how, in how far the US will also um, focus on adaptation to climate change. But um, what, what I find interesting is that John Kerry is really uh, foreseen as part of the National Security um, Council in the US and uh, that he has announced to tackle climate change as a urgent national security threat. So this, um, this is really a good sign in, in regard to, to, to acknowledging that climate change does have an impact on peace and security worldwide. But it remains to be seen what this means in detail for uh, on the policy agenda, but I'm really, really uh, looking forward to, 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 to learning what his plans are in this regard. Um, we, I can imagine that this will also spur the debate on climate and security in general, but in particular in the Security Council as well, where we, at a time, were considering uh, putting forward a resolution on this issue. But um, as you might imagine, there was still some skepticism floating around among the mem among some members of the Security Council, which is why we refrain from doing so and rather um, use different fora and tracks. But I, I, I can well imagine that that there might be a window of opportunity ahead of us for, for this idea. And, and, and the ideas that we had put into such a possible resolution are still there. And I think they are still still um, timely and valid and, and hopefully they will be picked up 
by um, some of our partners who are also behind that issue. Um, uh, and I think that this, that this this change will mean a lot because the U.S. belongs to the strongest opponents of discussing, you know, climate or climate change in in Security Council. And with the new administration, this is about to change rapidly. I think, uh, without taking too much time, our, our future plans. I mean, of course, we have, we've handed the baton in Security Council world to 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 Norway, Ireland, and Kenya, who all are behind that issue and, and will push the agenda forward and we are closely working with them and sharing our lessons learned and experiences and also the draft resolution as I mentioned. Um, I think what remains to be done is yeah we, we, we need to try and this, re this relates to the second question as well we need to try to re to, to to convince the skeptics, uh, skeptics that um, climate change is real that it is global it is happening now as we've seen in the documentary and that it, is, it can pose a real threat to um to to the security situation for the people uh, uh impacted uh there um as we speak and um 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 of course this is based not not mainly our problem here in Europe in I mean the security uh dimension of the whole thing but I think such such documentaries as the Mars Abit one we saw make it really tangible what it can mean uh, to people and I think we we need to use all our Public communication, public diplomacy channel, to 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 made to be made uh, to have this been well seen and felt by the people. And um, we were we were when I was still working in Berlin on this issue, we were we were in close contact with uh, also the representatives for, uh, of Fridays for Future, for example, because they have they can outreach to the younger generation that needs to that that really needs to be involved actively involved and needs to be given the chance to to participate in this whole debate so i i really think we need to 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 um to use all means available to us from international fora on a high political level to public diplomacy of bringing this message forward and um i think the acceptance that climate change is happening isn't really that uh, low within the within our, our societies it's it's more that um, people can sometimes not really imagine what it actually means and what disastrous um, impact it can have and such documentaries as the one we've seen can really make a difference in in in, in making this tangible and, and, and visible so I I, I I i i stop here to give the others the opportunity to to answer questions as well thank you thank you very much indeed um Christoph, and I see that we have just uh, one more question for um, Mr. Obadiah Kassang from Patrick Berg from the Berghoff Foundation. So Patrick, would you like to uh, pose your question, please? Unmute your microphone and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to really move uh, the levels from the international community down to, uh, to the local level. I think what we've seen that the actual killing of, of uh, groups on the ground is not helped by the John Kerry's of the world, but by local leaders. Um, in the movie, we saw very encouraging, strong uh, women who had been elected to the local councils. Um, and I would like to, uh, we've also seen the elders in the communities who were traveling with uh, pastoralists and explaining things. So my question to you, Mr. Uh, Kisang, is, where do you see the traditional and non-traditional local leaders uh, can be complementary in addressing these conflicts? Um, and also given that uh, the traditional leaders are very, very often elderly men, um, how can the perspectives of women and the younger generation be better integrated when working with traditional leaders? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for your question. And uh, before I uh, turn over to uh, Obadiah Kisang to answer it, uh, which I will do in just a second, uh, when you have uh, addressed this, um, Mr. Kisang, I'm going to ask the other panelists, uh, starting with Sonia Reynes Juvenides, then uh, Mark Friedrich, and then Elida Badram, if they have a short one sentence um, response that they would like to add to any of these questions or a another one sentence top priority uh, in before I pass over to our friend and colleague and partner, Lucas Rutinger from the Adelphi, uh, from Adelphi to close this discussion. So uh, Obadiah, it's over to you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just want to respond to the question raised by Patrick. Yeah, uh, we have the two, the non-traditional 
leaders and the traditional leaders. Uh, the traditional leaders are actually leaders who have been there and the structure has been there since, uh, I don't know when, but it's sometimes back and it is being followed. Now the non-traditional leaders actually come in uh, because of their technical expertise, their knowledge, and the roles that are given, uh, maybe by the government or the organization uh, they are working. And one of the key things that really integrates these two types of leaders is trust building. Any leader that is not traditional has really to build relationship with the local leaders and the local communities for acceptability. And once non-traditional leader is accepted and trusted, now it becomes part of that society and can be able even to influence their thinking, uh, work with them to champion for some things as a team. So it's very key that really that relationship is built and the leaders need to be very close. And then non-traditional leaders need to be very close to the opinion leaders, uh, the elders, uh, the women, the men, and the youth, just to work with them uh, on a, almost like a day-to-day -day basis with their, with, their, with their life. And uh, when it comes to these interventions uh, we are undertaking in this area of Marsabi and other counties, uh, we have a special emphasis on youth and women. This is because of the traditional ownership of wealth, uh, which comes from the livestock that usually belong to the men and the more so the elderly men. The young generation and the women usually don't uh, own or even uh, access uh, wealth that is related to livestock. So these alternative sources of livelihood we are mentioning actually give special emphasis on the youth and the women. And we have seen a lot of uptake on these alternative sources of livelihood. The biogas actually is being run by like women because they are the ones who are cooking. And some of them have a surplus gas that they can sell even to their neighbors. The youth are ventured into business that are not directly related to livestock. And they are making good progress. Some of them have gone to vocational training and they are coming back as artisans. They can build houses, repair motorbikes and vehicles and things like that. And they have also become ambassadors of peace because uh, as they do their work, they integrate with peace messages uh, and even visiting their fellow youth and women and just pass message of peace, just the way you have seen uh, from the video. Thank you, let me stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so now I'm going to uh, turn to the remaining uh, panelists, uh, starting with, with you, Sonia. Uh, if you have a closing sound bite you would like to share. Okay, Laura, I'm tasked with a sound bite, but you know me. But just really quickly, so on Key's question, I read that, happy to be in touch with you and think about how to do that. It's something we're doing within the organization. Um, Oops, so, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. Number one to policymakers to do no harm. So looking at uh, work on the climate crisis and security from a do no harm perspective, conflict sensitive. Number two, um, in terms of more public diplomacy, you've seen the film. If you have another idea anywhere else that you think it should be shown, um, let us know. We would love to see how it could get out there and there could be more conversations around it. And number three, I think what we tried to do and deliberately with the film was for some of the skeptics, right, who said climate change is not going to affect us anytime soon. It's inevitable, right? We have no power. And I think the film shows a message of hope um, and not a doom and gloom. And there are solutions, but regrettably from the highest emitters, the problems are further away. Um, but uh, thanks all for, for the ability to exchange on this and look forward to, to more such things. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sonia. Mark, do you have a closing soundbite for us? 
Uh, let me try. Um, I, I saw uh, Case's comment on, on the question and answer as well. I think I, I don't have a sort of ready-made solution to, to that one. I think it is definitely something that we will all still need to work on more and to see where we can find those interlinkages. One that um, hasn't come up very much here today, I think Alina referred to it earlier on, but that may be worthwhile underlining at the end of this discussion is, is the issue of the climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation measures. Um, we've been talking a lot about how um, climate change uh, causes conflict. Uh, we need to be sure that uh, when, we, when we have these discussions in a few years time, we won't be talking about how climate, adapta climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation measures are causing conflict. I think this is definitely one area where um, the, the scientific community working on climate change and peace builders can work closely together um, and, and find solutions already now. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And Elina Badram, do you have a final soundbite for us? Yes, certainly. Um, and I would uh, try and crystallize my message on, on three points. One, uh, we should make the most of the current prevailing uh, favorable circumstances that uh, really uh, allow the geopolitics to, to um, make a difference in taking climate action forward in, in many different areas, including conflict and security. Uh, it's clear that the incumbent administration will take a completely different tone for the US and, and that has a lot of potential and scope. Secondly, engagement and empowerment of the citizen, the communities, the, the kind of participation of NGO, civil society, in a way that brings government closer to the real people. And thirdly, uh, there is no one size fits all. Contextualization, making sure that in the prevailing circumstances, we exploit the power of the uh, paradigm or the uh, paramount chiefs, the different elders, that the real uh, decision makers and, uh, you know, shape, uh, opinion shapers to the full extent. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And now I am pleased to hand over to Lukas Rüttiger from Adelphi. Uh, Adelphi and Lukas have been our partners in this uh, series of events, and we're very happy to ha offer you the final word today, Lukas. Thank you, Laura. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank, um, of course, all the panelists and the participants for the great discussion. Um, we'd also like to thank um, Eplo, Sonia for the support. Uh, Laura is always a great facilitation. And of course, Lorenzo for the organization of this and all the past events. And, um, and of course, the German for Panel Foreign Office for the generous support. And um, I also tried to look back a bit at the, all of the eight events we did together now in, in 2020. It was eight, eight in total, uh, quite a bit. Um, and um, all of them aimed at bringing together civil society experts and policymakers to discuss climate-related security risks and really understand a bit better of what we can do about it. Um, and all of the events had really great participation and definitely some of the best discussions I have taken part in the past year. And we covered really broad range of topics um, from water security to natural resource management to gender and climate security and different geographic contexts from Lake Chad to the Pacific and Pakistan. And all of the discussions over the past months have really clearly shown the, the interest in the topic, both from the policy level, as well as from, um, from practitioners from the ground and really the need to better integrate peace building and, and climate resilience programming and climate change adaptation. And of course, it's a new field, but we could also see that there is a lot of emerging lessons learned that can be used to inform action at the policy level as well as um, action on the ground. Um, and I would like to kind of share three personal points. And um, the first one is to mirror what Sonia said before, that um, action on the ground really needs to be um, informed by a thorough understanding of the conflict context and the role climate change plays in that context. So how it can amplify certain conflict drivers, but also how conflict can undermine the resilience of communities to climate change. 
And there's definitely a lot happening in the field of analysis um, and um, with support of the German Foreign Office um, at Delphi together with um, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and a whole range of other partners such as uh, Chatham House, United Nations University, International Crisis Group and the Institute for Security Studies will embark on a, uh, another three-year project called Weathering Risks where we will develop and pilot a new climate and security assessment approach that can be used by all or is meant to be used by all actors working in the field. Um, and I'm happy to provide more information if you're interested. Um, you can just contact me directly on that. My second point is um, on capacities and that we really need more capacities to do such integrated analysis and then implement programs. Um, and this includes things like trainings, but also I think these kind of formats as we have here um, to foster the um, exchange and really build a community of practice that bridges climate change adaptation and peace building and um, brings people together to kind of exchange lessons learned and to learn from each other and to learn from each other's tools and experiences of the past 20 years. And then the um, uh, last point, maybe more aimed at the policymakers in this round, um, is to foster action on the ground. We need more dedicated fund, uh, financing for integrated um, programming. So uh, there is, of course, a need to mainstream this topic into existing peace building um, programming and existing adaptation um, programming. But alongside that, there's also a need for dedicated funding streams. And the EU, EU has really been leading in that field, for example, with the instrument contributing to peace and stability funding, some of the first projects that integrate peace building and climate change adaptation. But um, with a view to the new multi-annual financial framework, we of course hope that the EU um, continues on this path and ensures that there will be a dedicated place for climate security funding within that. And with that, I would like to end and hand it back over to Laura, thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Lucas, uh, not only for your closing remarks today, but also for the uh, partnership that we've enjoyed with you and your colleagues uh, over this, this whole two series now of events. And uh, let's hope we can look forward to welcoming everybody to a third series before too long. Um, I have only to thank our panelists today. So first of all, Ambassador Thomas Ossow Ossowski, I'm sorry, and Christoph Meinberger, both from the German representation to the European Union. Um, Alina Badram from DG Klima, Mark Friedrich from FBI, Obad Obadiah Kisang from World Vision Kenya, and Sonia Reynas Givanides from EPLO. And I would like to thank Lorenzo Angelini, who has done everything to get this meeting on air, and to thank you all for your participation. There will be a report of this, uh, which will be sent to you uh, in due course. And for reports of previous events, please check our website and indeed for links to Masterbeat. So then the Masterbeat uh, link is in the chat box. Please do watch it again and share it with your friends. And wherever you are, I'd like to wish you a very, very good day. And we hope to see you for, uh, in the new year. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.